Lecture 3, The Telling of the Tale. Ladies and gentlemen, verbal distinctions should be valued since they stand for mental, for intellectual distinctions. And yet, one feels that it is somehow a pity that the word poet should have been split asunder. For in our days, when we speak of a poet, we think, we only think of the utterer of such lyric, bird-like notes as with ships the sea was sprinkled far and nigh like stars in heaven from Wordsworth or music to hear why hear is thou music sadly sweets with sweets worn out joy delights in joy while the ancients when they spoke of a poet a maker as Dombar has it thought of him not only as the utterer of those high lyric notes, but also as the teller of a tale, a tale wherein all the voices of mankind might be found, not only the lyric, the wistful, the melancholy, but also the voices of courage and of, and of hope. This means that I am speaking of the oldest form of poetry, I suppose, the epic. And since we are speaking of the epic, let us consider a few of them. I suppose that the first one that comes to our mind is what Andrew Lang, who so finely translated it, called the tale of Troy, and we will look into it for that very ancient telling of a tale. In the very first verse, we have something like, tell me, muse, I have no Greek, tell me, muse, of the anger of Achilles, or as Professor Rouse, I think, has translated it, an angry man, that is my subject. Now perhaps, <laughs> now perhaps Homer, or the men we call Homer, for that is a moot question, of course, thought that he was writing his poem about an angry man. And this somehow disconcerts us, for we think of anger as the Latins did. Ira, furor, brevis, anger is a brief madness or a, brief, or a fit of madness. And the, the, the plot of the Iliad is really in itself not a it's a charming one. I mean, the idea of the hero sulking in his tents, feeling that, that the king has dealt unjustly with him, and then taking up the war as a private feud because his friend had been killed, and afterwards selling the dead man he had killed to his father. But perhaps, I may have said this before, I'm sure I have, perhaps the intentions of a poet are not very important. What is important nowadays is that though Homer may have thought he was telling that story, he was telling something far finer than that. The story of a man, the hero, who is attacking a city he knows 
he will never conquer. He knows that he will die before the fall of Troy. And the still more stirring tale of men defending a city whose doom is already known to them, a city that is already in flames. So I think that this is a real subject of the Iliad. And it is a fact that men have always felt that the Trojans were the real heroes. We think of Virgil, but we may also think of Snorri Sturlason, who in his younger era wrote that Odin, the warden of the Saxons, the god, was the son of Priam and the brother of Hector. So that men have sought kinship with the defeated Trojans and not with the victorious Greeks. Perhaps because there is a dignity in defeat that hardly belongs to victory. And we have now the second epic, the Odyssey. And the Odyssey may be read in two ways. But I suppose that the man or the woman, Samuel Butler, thought so, who had written it, felt that there were really two stories. That is to say, the homecoming of the of Ulysses and the marvels and the perils of the sea. If we take the, the Odyssey in the first sense, then we have that idea of homecoming, the idea that we are in banishment, that our true home is in the past or in heaven or somewhere else, that we are never at home. But, of course, the, the seafaring or the homecoming had to be made interesting. And so the many marvels were worked in. And already, when we come to the Arabian Nights, we find that the Arabian version of the Odyssey, the seven voyages of Sinbad, the sailor, are not a story of homecoming, but a story of adventure. And I think that we read it thus. I think that when we read the Odyssey, what we feel is the glamour, the magic of the sea. What we feel is what we find in the seafarer, for example. He has no heart for the harp, nor for the giving of rings, nor for the delight of a woman, nor for the greatness of the world. He thinks only of the long sea salt streams. So that we have both stories into one. We can read it as a homecoming and we can read it as a tale of adventure, perhaps the finest that has ever been written or sung. And we come now to a third, we might call it poem, that looms, I should say, far above them. And I am thinking of the four Gospels. And the Gospels may also be read in two ways. By the believer, they are read as a strange story of a man, of a God, who atones for the sins of mankind. A God who condescends to suffering, to death on the bitter cross, as Shakespeare has it. There is a still stranger interpretation. I found that in Langland. The idea 
that God wanted to know all about human suffering and that it was not enough for him to know it intellectually as a God might, but that he wanted to suffer as a man and with the limitations of a man. And if you are an unbeliever, many of us are, then you can read the story in a different way. You can think of a man of genius, of a man who thought that he was God and who at the end found out that he was merely a man and that God, his God himself, had forsaken him. And it might be said that for many centuries those three stories, the tale of Troy, the tale of Ulysses, the tale of Jesus, have been sufficient for mankind. People have been telling and retelling them over and over again. They have been set to music. They have been, they have been painted. People have told them many times over and yet, the stories are still there, illimitable. We might think of somebody within a thousand years or ten thousand years writing them over again. But in the case of the Gospels, there is a difference. The story of Christ, I think, cannot be told better. It has been told many times over. And yet, I think that the few verses where we read, for example, of Christ being tempted by, the, by Satan are stronger than the four books of paradise regained. Perhaps one feels that Milton had no inkling of what kind of a man Christ was. Well, we have these stories and we have the fact that men did not need many stories. I don't suppose Chaucer ever thought of inventing a story. I don't think people were less inventive in those days than they are today. I think that they felt that the new shadings brought into a story, that the fine shadings brought into it were enough. And besides, it made things easier for the poet. His hearers or his readers knew what he was going to say, and so they could take in all the differences. Now, in the epic, as I say, and we might think of the Gospels as a kind of divine epic, all things could be found. But then poetry, as I say, has fallen asunder. Or rather, we have, on the one hand, we have the lyrical poem and the elegy. And then we have the telling of a tale. We have the novel. One is almost tempted to think of the novel as a degeneration of the epic. In spite of such writers as Joseph Conrad, for example, or Herman Melville, where the novel goes back to the dignity of the epic. If we think of the novel and the epic, we are tempted to fall into thinking that the chief difference lies in the difference between verse and prose, in the difference between singing something and stating something. But I think that there is a greater difference. I think the difference lies in the fact that the important thing about the epic is a hero, a man who is a pattern for all men. While, as Mencken pointed out, the 
the essence of most novels lies in the, in the breaking down of a man, in the degeneration of, of character. Now, this brings us to another question. This brings us to what we think of happiness, what we think of defeat and of victory. For nowadays, when people talk of a happy ending, they think of it as a mere pandering to the public, or they think it is a commercial device, they think of it as artificial. And yet, during centuries, men could very sincerely believe in happiness and in victory, though they felt, as I have said, the dignity, the essential dignity of defeat. For example, when people wrote about the Golden Fleece, that is one of the ancient stories of mankind, readers and hearers were made to feel from the beginning that the treasure would be found at the end. Well, nowadays, if an adventure is attempted, we know that it will end in failure. We know, for example, when we read, I'm taking an example I admire, the Aspen papers, we know that the papers will never be found. When we read Franz Kafka's The Castle, we know that the man will never get inside the castle. That is to say, we cannot really believe in happiness and in success. And this may be one of the poverty of our time. I suppose that Kafka felt much the same when he wanted his books to be destroyed, because he really wanted to write a happy and a victorious book and he felt that he could not do it. He might have written it, of course, but people would have felt that he was not telling the truth, not the truth of facts, but the truth of his dreams. And we come to another fact. The fact that, let's say, at the end of the 18th or at the beginning of the 19th century, we need hardly go into the discussion of dates, men began to invent stories. Perhaps one might say that the attempt began with Hawthorne and with Edgar Allan Poe. But of course, there are always four runners. Nobody is, as Darío pointed out, the literary Adam. The fact remains, however, that Poe wrote that a story should be written for the sake of the last sentence and a poem for the sake of the last verse. This degenerated into the trick story and in the 19th and in our own centuries people invent all kinds of plots and those plots are sometimes very clever. Those plots, if merely told, are cleverer than the plots of the epic. And yet, somehow, we feel there is something artificial about them, or rather, something it's a trivial it's about them. If we take two well, if we take two cases, let us suppose the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And then if we take such a novel or a film, a psycho, perhaps the plot of the second is cleverer. But we feel that there is more behind Stevenson's plot. And this idea that I spoke about at the beginning, the idea about there being a few plots, perhaps 
we should add to those plots, we should add those books where the interest lies not in the plot, but in the shifting, in the changing of many plots. I am thinking of the Arabian Nights, of the Furioso, and so on. We might add also the idea of, of an evil treasure. We get that in the Volsunga Saga, perhaps at the end of Beowulf, the idea of a treasure bringing evil to the people who find it. Then we might come to that idea, the same idea I tried to work out in my last lecture on the metaphor. The idea that perhaps all plots belong to some, to a few patterns. Of course, nowadays, people are inventing so many plots that we are blinded by them. But perhaps this fit of inventiveness may flicker, and then we may find that those many plots are but appearances of a few essential plots. This, however, is not for me to discuss. Now, there is another fact to be noticed, and it is that poets seem to forget that once the telling of a tale was essential, and that the telling of a tale and the uttering of verse were not thought of as different things. A man told a tale, he sang it, and his readers did not think of him as a man attempting two tasks, but rather attempting one task that had two sides to it, or perhaps they did not feel there were two sides to it. They thought of the whole thing as one essential thing. We come now to our time, and we find this very strange circumstance. We have had two world wars, and somehow no epic has come from them, except perhaps the seven pillars of wisdom. But in the seven pillars of wisdom, and I find many epic qualities there, in the seven pillars, the book is hampered by the fact that the hero is the teller. And so sometimes he has to belittle himself, he has to make himself human, he has to make himself far too believable. In fact, he has to fall into the tricks of the, of the novelist. And there is another book. This must be a quite forgotten book now that I'm speaking of it. I read it, I think, 1915, a novel called Le Feu by Henri Barbus. Now, Le Feu was written by a pacifist. It was a book written against war, and yet somehow epic, epic, it has thrust itself through the book. I remember a very fine bayonet charge. And there is another writer who had the epic sense. I'm thinking of Kipling. We get this in such a wonderful story as a Sahib's War. But in the same way that Kipling never attempted the sonnet because he thought that might estrange him from his readers. He never attempted the epic, though he might have done it. And I am reminded now of Chesterton. Chesterton wrote the ballad of the White Horse, a poem about King Alfred's wars with the Danes. And therein we find very strange metaphors. I wonder how I forgot to quote them last time. For example, marble like solid moonlight, gold like a frozen fire, 
And there we have marble and gold. And marble and gold are compared to two things that are even more elementary. They are compared to moonlight and to fire. And then, not to fire itself, but to a magic frozen. It is fire. But the people, in a way, are hungering and thirsting for epic. Because I feel that epic is one of the things that men need. And of all places, epic has been furnished to the world. And this may come as a kind of anticlimax, but the fact is there by the Hollywood. For all over the world, men, when they see a Western, when they are beholding the mythology of the rider and the desert and justice and the sheriff and the shooting and so on, get the epic feeling from it, whether they know it or not. But after all, knowing the thing is not important. Now, I do not want to prophesy, because those things are dangerous, though they may come true in the long run. But I think that if the telling of a tale and if the singing of verse could come together again, then a very important thing might happen. And perhaps this will come, I think, from America. Because, as you all know, America has an ethical sense, a sense of a thing being right or wrong that may be felt in other countries, but I do not think it can be found in such an obvious way as I find it here. And thus, if this could be achieved, if we could go back to the epic, then I think something very great would have been accomplished. Chesterton wrote the ballad of the White Horse. It got good reviews and so on, but the readers did not take kindly to it. In fact, when we think of Chesterton, we think of the Father Brown saga and not of that poem. I have been thinking about the subject well, rather late in life, and besides, I do not think I could attempt the epic, though I may have worked in two or three lines of epic. This is for younger men to do. And I hope, and I hope they will do it. Because, of course, I think that we all feel that the novel is somehow breaking down. For example, if we think of the chief novels of our time, let us take Joyce's Ulysses, we think or we know that we are told thousands of things about the two characters, and yet we do not know them. I think we have a better knowledge of characters in Dante or Shakespeare who come to us, who live and die in a few sentences. We do not know thousands of circumstances about them, but we know them intimately. And that, of course, is far more important. I think that the novel is breaking down. I think that all these, those very daring and very interesting experiments with a novel, for example, the idea of the shifting of time, the idea of a story being told 
by different characters, all those are leading to the moment when we shall feel that the novel is no longer with us. But there is something about a tale, a story, that will always be going on. I do not think men will tire of telling or of hearing stories. And if to the pleasure of being told a story we get the additional pleasure and the dignity of verse, then something great will have happened. And maybe I am an old-fashioned man from the 19th century, but I have optimism, I have hope, and as the future holds many things, as the future perhaps holds all things, I think that the epic will come back to us. I think that a poet shall once again be a maker. I mean, he will tell a story and he will also sing, sing it. And we will not think of those two things as different, even as we do not think they are different in Homer or in Virgil. <laughs>